welcome to episode 15 of I Guess We'll Do It That Way. Today we're talking about scripts, scripts, scripts. It's all about scripts. I'm even going to break down a piece of one that I wrote. Also, important announcement time, our release date is changing to Friday. So expect part two of this episode this Friday. I will see you there. I Guess We'll Do It That Way is presented by Mama Bear Studios. Mama Bear's mission is to create entertaining works of art that explore our humanity. Okay, here's episode 15. Oh, dude, I'm feeling so good. Oh, yeah? You know why? You know what I did this morning, John? Tell me. I sat around thinking about the book of Ecclesiastes uh, 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 uh. and how great it is that I'm not in control of basically all of the most important factors in my life. So this is the book of Ecclesiastes written in 1967 by L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> He's got some great stuff to say about, mm-hmm. about life, about the origin of things. Mm-hmm. It involves spaceships. I'm a big sci-fi fan, so Scientology is a clear front runner in my mind for sort of philosophical systems to adhere to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the Mormons, they believe in that outer space stuff, too. You know, that heaven, they, the Mormons believe that when they go to heaven, they each get a planet. Why would you want your own planet, though? To rule over it. Become yeah, your own god. who's living there? Uh, who are you ruling? Your presu- children? Presumably, it would be, like, creatures that you've created, and then you can torment for all eternity. Interesting. Or not. Maybe you can make a beautiful, make, you can make it, like, a beautiful playground no i i i'm I'm actually not kidding though it's i i don't i don't think i'm ever happier than when i'm realizing this about myself i i'm never happier than when i'm relinquishing sort of my like death grip on my life you know Mm. because i'm just such an anxious person that like when i think about the fact that i have no control over when and where i was born and most of the main sort of aspects of the of of the trajectory of my life so far that actually makes me feel good because then i can just focus on the stuff that i can enjoy you know so you're talking about sort of excising the stuff in your life that you can't control that might be negative and just letting it go and not worrying about it i yeah Kind of. Like, I have a lot of car anxiety, you know, when I'm driving because yeah. I'm terrified of other drivers. But I have a lot more fun in the car. For instance, when we drove out to Los Angeles, you know, it was a five days of driving about. And I actually really enjoyed it because I was like, you know, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And all I can really do is be a good driver. I can't worry about the fact that some idiot might be on his phone driving 100 miles an hour and run me off the road. That's <laughs> either going to happen or it's not going to happen. Yeah. So why why ruin five beautiful days of driving through our beautiful country, mm-hmm. worrying about some idiot? There's no point. There might be if it makes you more alert. That's the thing. I'm, I I think what I'm not talking about is being blissfully ignorant. I'm mm. talking about being willfully ignorant. No, there's a no no no. There's no ignorance involved. Mm. I like sitting around thinking about the fact that. Oh, I don't like sitting around thinking about the fact that I might die. But I like sitting around thinking about the fact that I don't really have a lot of control over when I die. So that way I can just really sit around thinking about how much I love what I do and how cool it is that I get to do what I love. That That's an interesting point. I It, it occurs to me that the opposite side of this coin about the depressive realism is you mm-hmm. look at the world, you see mostly the bad, mm-hmm. or you're extremely bothered by the bad. You know, I always have this feeling when I meet people or even if I hear something good about somebody that I don't really know, Mm -hmm. right? Like uh, such and such that's running a small business in town. Sure, sure. People are saying he's a good guy. And let's say I run into this guy and finally meet him. Mm -hmm. I always have the feeling of like, where's the disappointment going to come from? Mm. You know, like how is this guy going to disappoint me? Is he crazy? Is he avaricious you know what's the deal here you yeah. ever feel like that i do feel like that that's um hmm you know that yeah this is all really tough because in some ways i wish i had good advice for you to how you know for how to like free yourself from that but then there is a very real component of he will disappoint you if you go deep enough exactly if you get to know him that is a fact that is a 
law of relationship physics that's immutable. But that is true of your wife, too, and that doesn't mean that you want to leave her. How dare you, you know? sir? Slash, how, how do you know? <laughs> well, I'm just saying it's not necessarily true. It's not sure. a fact that the – it's not a fact. It does not – it is not a, I don't know, I wish I was better at, like, logic rules and stuff. It's not, it may correlate, but it's not cause, at, you know, it's not causing the fact that you might want to leave her, the fact that mm. she's going to disappoint you. That is going to be present whether or not you stay together or not. It's been, like, 15 years, and I haven't been disappointed once yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming, baby. It's just a <laughs> dam of disappointment just building up. It's just going to crash down. It's like the Hoover Dam now. I just live in a slow trickle of disappointment. That's the mm-hmm. way I like to live my life. Just a nice, just let it all in as it comes so that way it never builds up and turns into a giant torment, you know? Exactly. No, this is, John, I was thinking we should talk about, we, we never really finished, well, we're never going to finish it. We never, we never, I, I would like to go a little deeper on uh, writing, talking about writing. Sure. And I think that's something that, you know, we're talking about, the you know, <coughs> this kind of ongoing existential pondering that we both are always going through but that's obviously kind of related to writing in a way um but i don't know i i I think like it would be fun even kind of to start at the beginning like the real basics of Mm. scripts Mm. you know like how movies actually get written and assume that people listening maybe don't know much of anything about the actual reality of how those about how scripts are written but that might be boring, so I'm kind of running it by you to see like what you think. I don't know. We won't know if it's boring till we're done. I guess that's true. Okay. Um, so one place to start, John, would be because, again, you tend to bring me back to more interesting versions of, of sort of where I would jump ahead and sort of talk about things that are very jargony. Mm. What do you know about scripts? I'm sure it's a lot, but like let's, let's nah. kind of go back to the basics. <clears throat> Um, well, I've seen a few scripts and, um, have you I read think one before I've read, I don't know, maybe half a dozen. Okay. So that's probably a lot more than most people. Yeah. So there was a book at my local library in Pensacola, New Jersey. <clears throat> it was, uh, here we go again. It was, <laughs> it was, uh, do the right thing. The, mm. the Spike Lee movie. Yeah. And it was the entire script on one side if I remember correctly, and, well, no, it was a script, and then interspersed, it was sh- it was behind the scenes of them making the movie, like pictures, yep, and uh, stills from the movie, and it was sick, and that was the first script I ever read, and I was kind of amazed at how clear the dialogue was, hmm. sort of how you could really understand the dialogue is really clear, and also the direction, so it has uh, sort of where you are, you know, where out the shot is outside on a basketball court. So and so walks in, so there is a lot more description than I would have thought. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I guess I've read that, and maybe the I read the Hateful Eight script when when it got oh. leaked. How long is that? Uh, I can't remember. I mean, it was like two hundred, one hundred fifty pages. Is that possible? Very long. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that I would be surprised if it's that short. Honestly. Oh really? I can't. Well, remember, because but that was so pretty one, great. One, yeah, one basic script principle that. I think a lot of people are familiar with, but not maybe not everyone, is that there's a very specific formatting style that used to be developed. It was developed for typewriters, but now there's software that kind of emulates it. But there's a very specific formatting style that is is done in such a way that averaged out over – it gets kind of more accurate, I think, the the more pages, but it's about a minute per page of screen time. Ah. So. One page should equal roughly one minute of screen time. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It's it's partly because that's the best way to – so when you're making a budget and a schedule, and typically you make a budget based on a schedule, not the other way around, you, you break the script down into eighths of pages. And so you basically say like a really good um, first assistant director or whoever else is in charge of making the schedule – will basically say, you know, this kind of stuff. Like, if it's a really dialogue-heavy scene and it's really simple, you might blow through a lot more pages. But if it's a really big action scene, you know, you might only get through a lot less. So, but that's that's sort of one way of sort of... It's a very mechanical document, in a way. It's not like a book, you know? 
Uh, quick question. So, mm-hmm. say you have a movie like There Will Be Blood that has, you know, maybe ten sentences in a 20-minute span, sure. potentially. Do you space that out? This may, might be completely stupid, but do you do you space that out almost like music? Like, for instance, if you had a montage that has no dialogue, would you mm-hmm. type it out to say, you know, one minute of a shot of a guy running through the street? And then next page would be, you know what I'm talking about? No, no, yeah, that's a very good question. So that's part of the reason why it it varies depending on your writing style. Because a whole other side of this is that there's sort of an art to different writers, and there's different even fads that kind of go around. You know, like some writers will be very blocky, and I mean that in the sense that like they're 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 action. Okay, so let's let's back up one step. There's there's two main elements no there's really three main elements of a of 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 a script um the first and kind of the most basic is the the uh the slug line or the scene heading which is basically like interior or exterior location so actually give me two seconds because i'm just gonna pull i'm gonna pull something up what do you think of that pull it up all right i'm gonna pull up something i wrote and we can kind of go through it can you uh, can you deliver the, your commentary here as if it were in a script? Interior, Zay's apartment, Los Angeles. Um, yeah. Interior, apartment, day. <laughs> Zay clacks around on his keyboard looking for the shitty script he almost forgot about. Mm. He double clicks it. It pops up. See, that's too detailed. That right. that's a Is quick it? lesson. Okay. No, that's too detailed. I don't need to know that he double clicks it. That's that script pointless. sucks, man. Start that script over. sucks bad. Okay, look, I'm going to read you just a little chunk of a script yeah. I wrote called The Sidekick. What do you think of that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, this is the beginning. So this is, John, this will somewhat <clears throat> answer your question, and then I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to read you a more dialogue-heavy scene, okay? Great, yep. And so part of my job as a writer is to give you the picture of where we're at. And and this is what's important about a script is that they should read well. It should be interesting to read. It should, but it should read as though you're watching a movie, which means you're not going to mm-hmm. catch every single detail. It's not literature. You know, it's a, it's a blueprint for a movie. Sure. All right. So, um, this is a, this is the first, first half of a page. And, and John, the re- what I was going to say earlier, this is a very actiony, non dialogue scene. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I'm trying to think, I'll describe it very detailed. Like there are in this first half of a page, there's one paragraph with three lines, another paragraph with three lines. The next paragraph has six lines and then the next one has two. And so that is just the way I decided to write that because that's how it felt right. But some people love hitting return you know like they're they're like very they break up the text and then some people like i've read a coen brothers script where or even tarantino sometimes will just write like a 10 line block of action lines and so i should back up really quick before i start there's three main elements i said there's a slug line the scene heading type thing and in this case i'll start it exterior main street bakersfield baptist church day Okay, so we've got some elements here, exterior versus interior, right? And then you give the location, and that's really a subjective thing. There's no right or wrong way to do it, but you start specific. I'm sorry, you start broad, and then you get more specific. Okay. Does that make sense? So we go Main Street, and we're not just on Main Street generally, although I could totally, if I wanted to, just say Main Street, but it's relevant that we're in front of Bakersfield Baptist Church. And the last thing you put is day or night. And there are other things you can add there. It's not exclusively limited to that, but for our purposes, that's for So binary. Voting. Well, it doesn't have to be binary, John. Okay, all right. All right. Um, okay, several dozen townspeople stand in front of the church. This is a rough draft, by the way, so don't judge me too harshly. Several dozen, several dozen people stand <laughs> several... Mm, I'm going to start over. Mm. Exterior, Main Street, Bakersfield Baptist Church, day. Several dozen townspeople stand in front of the church. Their faces are as shabby and vacant as the blighted streets that surround them. A funeral march is about to begin. A few children carry signs. We'll miss you, Captain Steele. Another sign fe- simply features the chiseled jaw and striking eyes of the masked hero the march is meant to honor. Jake Chandler. Now I'm going to pause. Jake Chandler. This is the first speaking character 
that we've been introduced to. And so if you were looking at this, you would see that Jake Chandler, unlike previously a few children mm. or a dozen townspeople, Jake Chandler is in all caps. Gotcha. Because that's how you delineate. This is the first time we're meeting a character who has a, a role that is worth, like, he has a name. There are going to be extras. You don't have to do that. But this is a way to basically say this is a new character. His name is in all caps. And then there are different ways to, like, describe them. Some people, th there's a million different ways to do it, and I even do it differently depending on who it is in the context. But so Jake Chandler's in all caps. Jake Chandler, 27, stands by the ornate coffin at the front of the procession. His bloodshot eyes stare through an eye mask. His royal blue tights are accented by a green Speedo and a matching cape. A trumpet. Now, trumpet in this particular case is, is also um, capitalized because it's sort of a, a specific sound effect. That's the kind of thing, like, some people do that all the time. Some people don't. Shooting scripts typically have most sound effects are capitalized because again this is like a blueprint it's a way for people to scan the script really quickly and like mm. look for the elements that they're looking for <clears throat> right a trumpet rattles off like gunfire the rest of the brass quartet joins in the playing of just a closer walk with the with the help of five disinterested cops jake struggles to lift an ornate casket onto his shoulder title over the sidekick mm. now that's the opening scene basically and it takes up who let's say three eighths of a page, which is a little less than half. Um, depending on how I shot it, that could be a two minute scene or it could be a 30 second scene. It really just depends on how it comes together. Now there's no exact science to this. And so to your point, some people are going to write one line that encompasses potentially two whole minutes of the movie but mm -hmm. the assumption is that at some other points, you know, dialogue pages tend to go much quicker. Right. And so one page of really rapid back and forth dialogue is going to have a lot of white space. And so there's going to be a lot less actually happening. And so you're going to you're going to make up time mm -hmm. on those types of pages. Gotcha. Um, let me find another scene that's kind of. Uh... So this movie. What, yeah, I'm curious, John, what, do you, what, what did you take away from that? What what do you think this movie's about? Because I've never told you about this movie. What what, what uh, did you get? That's not, you're not going to hurt my feelings. That's not true. I've read this script before. You've read this one? I've read that script. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, you sent it to me a few years ago. I I have oh read boy. it. Um, but I you, I get a clear picture there. It I has mean, changed quite a bit, but yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you can see you can kind of picture exactly what's going on. If you had to, like, I think it's. If you can picture it clearly in your head, you've done the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in yeah. that case, there's virtually That's no how I feel. there's virtually no dialogue. So, yeah, if you can sort of frame out how it would be shot, essentially, in your brain, it's a success, right? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. So I'll read another scene. Um, this is about fourteen pages in. So theoretically, this would be happening at about minute 14 in the movie but who knows um are interior. you following sorry before you start because mm -hmm. presumably now we're somewhere in inside of the story so is there some sort of uh i don't say outline but some sort of system that you follow to hit plot points at different times in the movie yeah that's let's go there next um mm -hmm. Because that's a really, really yes. The answer, the short answer is yes, but the longer answer is, I think, really interesting. Be, partly because it's, um, I, I don't want to. Well, controversial might actually be the right term. I mean, it's it's a it's a divisive question, mm. um, and I can explain why. But let me jump ahead a little bit. Okay. We've now flashed back, which I delineated with a, a a slug line that says three days earlier, or title over three days earlier. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do that. Some people would not tell you that it's a flashback. Some people will have whatever. You know, like there's a million different ways to do it. Not mm -hmm. a million. There's a few. I chose to do that because I wanted it to be very clear. Um, interior, Merle's Diner, early morning. This is, uh, yeah, so this is a few days before this funeral. A novel-sized menu slams shut. If the diner had seen better days, it's forgotten them by now. A tiny television sits on every table in an effort to distract the customers from the otherwise drab surroundings. Jake and Captain Steele sink into the cracked seats of the vinyl booth. Captain Steele stares down at their television. Interior, nightly news set. A female anchor turns to the camera. 
In other news, the Viper has once again saved New York from total destruction. We go now to the press conference. Interior, press conference room. The sounder, so you see I'm like bouncing, like these slug lines are basically like showing where we are. And right. so there's a way to stay in the original scene, interior in Rolls Diner. There's a way to show a television while we're still <laughs> in the scene that we were originally in, but I want to express that what we're actually doing is we're cutting into this other world Mm -hmm. and so i give it a new i give it a new scene heading so um does that make sense yes and why are they called slug lines well now i'm getting all insecure and i can't remember if they're actually called slug lines (laughs) (laughs) oh well if they're not you'll find out who even knows oh boy this is this is really bush league for me to not just like have that someone i I don't know i don't talk about theory very often i just do it you know what i mean so it's I don't know I can I, I'll look it up I'll well find suddenly out, but, you're conducting a film uh, a film class here I know and I had no idea that's what I was doing. seems like so, you're unprepared for class sir I'm very unprepared okay so into your press conference room the sounds of eager reporters eager reporters are kind of in caps in this case I don't know exactly why I just thought it sounded right camera because that's what's beautiful about scripts you can do whatever you want if it works you can do it but Grammar that would be like an flexible. indication that would be an indication when shooting it that you would like make them prominent. Is that yes, the idea? It, that's the way I would. That's the way I'm using it. It's <clears throat> mm-hmm. not an ironclad thing, right? But yeah, that's the way I'm using it, and that's the beauty of it. Is it's very flexible. Like you can use periods the way you want. You can use incomplete sentences. In fact, um, you know, I very much am of the mind that like there are times where being kind of eloquent and descriptive is appropriate. But then when you're in the middle of an action scene you really don't want to slow people down with a bunch of unnecessary description you just want to give them the most basic stuff you want to give them you want to keep the pace going because i think a good script reads almost like the movie watches Mm -hmm. and so there are moments where you want to be nice and slow and patient and then there are moments where you want to be like boom 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 you know um the sounds of eager reporters cameras flash shutter swish the Viper, 34, ripped beyond reason, wears a radiant green suit. His face is partially concealed by a mask. Behind him, there's a wall plastered with the logos of the International Brotherhood of Superheroes and Megacorp. A dozen hands beg to be called on. Viper, Viper! He, whips, he wipes away copious sweat from his, from his face with a towel. He points to an eager young male reporter. He jumps up. Okay, so now we've got dialogue. Mm. Now... Those lines that I was just reading go from all the way on the left side of the page to all the way on the right side of the page. Can you picture that? Mm -hmm. And then dialogue takes up about the middle third of the page, and Mm -hmm. it's justified in the middle. And then the the name of the character speaking the dialogue is in all caps right down the center of the page. And so what that allows you to do is very, very quickly – know whether you're reading an action line or dialogue. And so I've read plays that are kind of funky where, like, everything is on the left. And, I mean, there's different ways to do it. But I very much am – I'm comfortable with this model because you just you can just read it really quick and know kind of exactly what you're getting. You don't have to ever pause and be like, wait, am I reading a description or am mm-hmm. I reading dialogue? Gotcha. Um, and this is so kind of universally done. That Yeah, definitely. So um, I'll, I'll get through this quickly, but, you know. <clears throat> Well, yeah, we, we don't need to keep – well, we didn't no, need to no, do any keep going. Okay, so – Keep going. So um, he points to an eager young male reporter. He jumps up. Male reporter, in all caps, in the middle. Great showing out there tonight. Do you think we'll be hearing any more from Dark Claw? The Viper. Uh, he's dead. So no more questions from that guy. Laughter, which is over on the left because it's like not either of them saying something. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Male reporter, you got me. You got me. More hands go up. He points to a female reporter. A nuclear warhead almost destroyed Manhattan. Again. You stopped it again. How does it feel? The Viper leans into the mic. Not as good as you're going to feel tonight, he winks seductively. Whoa, pause. Me too. <laughs> Movement. Well, he's Stand an asshole. Up. That's the whole point. See, I'm writing a character, John. I'm Something. writing a character. Wow. The it room goes like... wild. Hands shoot up with a barrage of flashes. The reporter sits. She's annoyed. Um... And so then, interior, Merle's Diner, boom, we're back. Captain Steele slams his fist on the table, startling Jake. The TV goes black, and Merle, fifties, walks over to their table with a pot of coffee. She pours a cup for the captain. Merle. Anyway, we can move on. But um, so you it. get the idea. I love it. Do you, um, <clears throat> the way that you, the, the first part of that before the dialogue, mm-hmm. would you say that that is more descriptive than the average script? The way it's written is like, 
it is uh, flowery is not the word because it sounds pejorative, but it is um, more there's detail. There's more detail than I've seen in scripts bef- in the like five that I've read. Yeah, there is. It's but if you read a different part of the script, I, I think that's partly because I'm still really early in the story and I'm really trying to set the scene. I'm trying mm, to describe okay. this place right. because the place is really important. You know, like the town is a really important part of the story, and so setting up kind of the shittiness of it and and making sure but then you know also that's the thing this is a rough draft i think there's a really good chance that by the time i'm quote done with the script Mm. that it could be much more stripped down if i read you a scene from rollers um it is actually quite a bit more punchy because sometimes when i'm writing i just need to let stuff come out and then i can go edit it later you Mm. know but i try Mm -hmm. not to edit myself too much while i'm in the middle of it um, so what's going on with this script right now with rollers? No, with, or with uh, the sidekick sidekick. Um, <clears throat> well, okay. So let's, th- this is actually a perfect segue into sort of the, the structure conversation. Mm. This is a, so this script is 129 pages long right now. Okay. Which is too long. Um, and that, that is what I mean by the segue is, Saying it is, quote, too long, obviously, is is assuming that there is a standard that I need to meet, right? And that, mm-hmm. in and of itself, is a bit of a divisive comment. Because some people, like Tarantino, makes three-hour-long movies. Now. And a three-hour-long movie would be 180 pages, which is like 50 pages more than this, you know? Yeah, but now he does. I mean, how, now how long is exactly. Reservoir Dogs? Oh, it's not three hours long and honestly i don't know that pt anderson is sort of famous for saying that if he was going to make magnolia again which is a terrific movie but he says if he's going to make it again he would make it a lot shorter and i think wow i don't know that what an idiot yeah exactly what a why would he do that um no but i don't think i so so but you're right he because every page costs money you know what i mean and so i'm at a point in my career where 129 pages is probably too long. There's a couple mm-hmm. reasons for that. One, because it's too expensive. <laughs> Two, because it's an early-ish draft. The truth is, th- and this is sort of uh, a different conversation, this is like the 10th version of this script that I've written. I've been writing this script since like 2014, and it's changed in major, major, major ways in the sense that the very first one I wrote was just a completely different story based on the same characters the next one, and I was writing it with my uncle, Will, and um, we wrote several versions together, and then, like, he kind of got super busy, so I've just kind of been pushing it ahead very slowly. Mm. But each version, there are probably, like, four completely different stories within this world that I've created. And then the last, maybe, the 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 first version that I sort of finished was a big kind of larger still small in the grand scheme of action movies but very much an action movie you know Mm. like there's no way we were going to make this thing for under like 30 million dollars or something i don't know and but i can't direct a 30 million dollar movie so i sat on it for a while didn't do a whole lot tried to get different actors attached tried to get different directors and it just wasn't going anywhere you know Mm. and then i sat down with it and i was like you know that i the, I've never like been totally in love with this. Maybe I should rethink it. So I rethought the whole story and made kind of the focus of it much more personal, much more character based. And now it's becoming more of kind of this mystery noir where basically the, the story is that Jake, the sidekick is trying to figure out why captain Steele died. And he has different motivations for doing that. But have you um, heard of the show? Have you heard of the movie Watchmen? I have heard of the movie. Have Watchmen. you seen it? I have. Yeah. Oh, it's not as good as the graphic novel, though. Graphic novel is pretty good, but it sounds like uh, similar elements, better. right? There are some. It, it's a very yeah. It's it's a very grounded um, superhero story. It's it's similar to Watchmen in the sense that yeah, there's not um, there are implausible things, kind of like Batman type stuff, but there's no Superman flying around, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. And but part of what's fun about the story is yeah, it's set in a small town. It's about a sidekick in a small town and and the superhero that he works for. And in this universe, there are lots of superheroes, as we see. You know, that's why it's important for me to show kind of the scene of the Viper because a huge part of this story is this – is the acknowledgement that there are bigger, better, more powerful, more successful heroes in these larger markets 
there you know the avengers in a form theoretically exist in this world not mm-hmm. the actual avengers but sure. but we are not telling that story we're telling the story of a shitty town called bakersfield in georgia which is not even a real place but you know what i'm saying like so the focus has turned to be much smaller and it's always been about a small town but the focus has sort of gotten more and more and more narrow for a number of reasons a because i think that's a more interesting story but also because of practical concerns such as i can't shoot a giant action movie and so that's part of the weird thing about writing is that it's it, uh, writing scripts is it's not a novel you can't just sit down in your room with a typewriter and write a write a space opera you know right. you've got to be very concerned with what you can actually pull off or off or else the art form will never sort of be completed you know because the script is not the end product yeah i mean i was about to i wrote a script about the life of uh, marcel proust and i was going to shoot it but it cost too much money so i just made videos of me in the bath with the cat <laughs> what percentage of that is true because i hope a hundred percent zero <laughs> oh man and the cat's gone Oh, bummer. Yeah, she she's left for greener pastures, maybe heavenly pastures. You know, okay, speaking of uh, de- de- departing for heavenly pastures and disappointment, I, I mean, it's now only now occurring to me that basically, well, just this whole disappointment conversation, that's actually kind of about what the, the, what the sidekick is about. Is he sort of pins his hopes you know, on this on this guy and on this uh, this dream of being a superhero, and right. a lot of that comes crashing down. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I I wasn't thinking about that before, but I do think you know it's a it's a, that's a thing that we all that's a thing that we all do. The, I know I've talked about this probably ad nauseum now, but it's really interesting to watch uh, Fortnite unfold. My kids mm. came up to me; they barely get to play. We play like one time a week, right? And it's mm, this huge. Sure, 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 sure. It's you know that you know it's just their babysitters Fortnite. You're just like, all right, kids, yeah. see you in eight hours. <laughs> well, no, my babysitters Fortnite. I'm like, go to bed, kids, and then I play all night. <laughs> no, that's not true either, but. You know, they play like that's what I would do. They play once a week. Right. And it's this huge like it's a great luxury for them. Mm -hmm. But they knew they heard that season six is coming out. They're so excited. I mean, they're just bursting at the seams like kids at school are talking about it. So season six, meaning it's the same engine, same. It's all the same same stuff. They just just different characters, different features, different. Exactly. Yeah. They change the map slightly. They change a couple things here and there. And, you know, it's. There's so much buildup. The kids are talking about it at school. They're just going nuts. And finally, we sat down. It came out last night. We sat down and played. And the kids are like, they're shaking. They're so excited. And then you start the game, and you immediately get killed by somebody who's way better than you. And it's just a wave (laughs) of absolute disappointment. (laughs) Someone who plays more than once a week. Yeah, exactly. Some other <laughs> some other kid from like Cleveland just annihilates them and humiliates them. And it's mm. the worst. You know, it mm. is this huge build up, huge tons of excitement and then just like it always ends in tears. Not to be too crude, but that's a little bit what uh first first time having sex is like, right? Oh gee, whiz. I depends, I guess. I mean, it's it's not a total wave of disappointment, but it's certainly not what you were fantasizing. I mean, I think that's a universal fact, right? Like, I don't know that anyone's ever had their best sex the first time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's no way, right? Uh, I think it depends. It really depends. You There's... think some people look back 15 years later and they're like, it never got better than that one time. <laughs> I don't know if they would say that. about one and a half minutes. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> it was awkward afterward. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. I don't know. Mom, are you listening? Oh, boy. This is getting deep. Hey, you um, can cut it out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I don't know if I will. It's kind of against my code. Anyway, um, I-, I think we should take a quick break. Yeah, I guess we're done for good. Um, I feel like we got a lot more to cover. There's no way we're going to get to it in a reasonable amount of time. So I think we should take a quick break. We're going to split this episode and we're actually this is a this is an important announcement. We are switching our release date to Friday. Mm. Mm. So um, I'm gonna uh, we're gonna put this second half of this episode out. It's gonna seem like a bonus episode, but it's actually gonna be our new <coughs> release date. So expect the second half of this episode this coming Friday. John, this is uh this has been a good episode. 
I guess I'll see you next week. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, Uncle Zay, we'll talk <laughs> soon, huh? Yep, in about one and a half minutes after I go pee. Love you, bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in for part one of our episode on Scramps. It's been a real hoot. And make sure to tune in this Friday because I think you're going to love part two, which is all about structure. Today's show is produced and edited by Isaiah Smallman, executive producer John Schimpf. Intro music is The Get Down by Summer Dregs. Outro music is The Man From Nowhere by Tom Paulus and Max Bells. Our cover art was designed by the great Ned Giordano. This has been a production of Mama Studios. It's your boy.